Welcome to Opless TV. Today we have Jack Ingalls, the new CEO of AMA, or the Alternative Investment Management Association. Now, Jack, AMA has grown rapidly in recent years with membership at an all-time high of 1,400 firms and manager member assets at a peak of $1.5 trillion U.S. Now, you've doubled your staff in the last five years. You've also doubled your revenues. What does the future hold under your leadership, and how do you plan to continue the growth of AMA? That's right, Greg. We, we certainly have grown. And we have more staff than we've ever had in the past. We've got more members than we've ever had in the past. And those members are spread more globally than we've ever had in the past. The one thing I'm very confident about and very optimistic about is the continued growth of the hedge fund industry. We're currently just short of $3 trillion of assets under management at the most recent estimates. Uh, but I've been reading some guides recently that suggest that the industry could grow to $5 trillion within the next two or three years. So growth is continuing in the industry. And I think the part that we can play will benefit from that growth. But I really think what is also important to recognize is that since 2008, the demands of, a, of an association like us and the demands put on AMA have also grown from our members. The vast swathe of new regulation that has been put in place and which members have had to contend with, both as they run their asset management firms, but also how they operate in the marketplace, have become very, very complex for them to have to be able to navigate their way through. We've had a very significant growth in our government and regulatory affairs department, which have helped our members navigate their way through this and also achieve indirect advocacy efforts with regulators and policymakers around the world, outcomes which we think are appropriate and proportionate for the industry. When I was thinking about joining AMA, one of the questions that I asked myself was, is that wave of, of new regulation is that now over? Are we past the hump? And therefore, is the relevance of, of what AMA can do on behalf of its members, is it diminished now that that has happened? And when I asked that question to myself, and when I asked that question to a lot of other hedge fund managers out there, I got the resounding answer that no, there is still so much to do in that field, both in the market side and really globally around every jurisdiction and where we have a presence. And I think the continuing work that we will do on the regulatory front is going to continue to be very important to our members. A very good example of that in, in Europe, for example, post AIFMD, which really impacted how people thought about their asset management firms operating in Europe, we're now moving on to the market side of things with MIFID II rapidly coming down the pipelines and of issues that we need to address. And that's going to be a massive body of work, somewhat in the way that AFMD was also a massive body of work that we had to contend with. So I'm very optimistic that we've, for the industry, I'm very convinced and, and, and confident that the services that we can provide our members with will continue to be in demand and there's still a lot of work for us to do. In terms of our educational work, that really continues undiminished. One of the things that was very obvious and came out from the crisis that certain policymakers and regulators had somewhat limited understanding of the hedge fund industry and that potentially knee-jerk reactions to that in, in, in regulatory form could have had unintended consequences and may have had unintended con consequences which impacted not just our members but and also the functioning of the capital markets. And it's very important that we continue to educate not just at the, the policymaker and regulator level, but really through the whole spectrum of stakeholders. And that includes with investors, and that also includes with the general public, where I still think that hedge funds are not, not viewed with the highest esteem that, um, that they could be. AMA has developed a reputation as a thought leader in the hedge fund space and recently released an educational guide on hedge fund performance called Apples and Apples, which received widespread coverage. Now, what was the goal of the report, and what were some of the main points that were made? So that report and that study was, was really driven by many of our members expressing privately to us frustration with some of the commentaries they were reading in the press that was comparing very simply hedge fund, uh, hedge fund performance from a broad index level with the S&P 500. And we saw it at the end of last year, which was a particularly good year for equities, not an awfully bad year for, for hedge funds, but nevertheless, there was a big discrepancy between the performance. And we think that doesn't really represent what the industry is about, what the, the industry's performance is actually achieving on behalf of investors. 
So the, really the study was driven to delve down deeper into understanding hedge fund performance. This is not all about the S&P 500 and, 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 uh, and comparing the performance with that because there are many hedge fund strategies which don't have a single equity in their portfolios. Therefore, to compare it with an equity index is obviously patently wrong. So I think it's important to understand the asset classes in each strategy. I think it's also important to look at these things, not just on small windows of time, even a one-year window of time, to me is a very short period, but increasingly we're seeing quoted in the press at the end of each month, hedge funds either underperformed or outperformed the S&P 500 and therefore making statements based on the success of the hedge fund industry thereon. We think that's wrong. I think you really need to look at hedge fund performance in the context of a longer period of time of long-term investment horizons. And indeed, what is the volatility of the performance of those hedge fund returns. And this is where you get into risk-adjusted returns. And really that is what has been driving sophisticated investors continual move into hedge funds and increased allocations into the hedge fund sector. And even over the past few years, and, and even with those comments about 2013 performance, the first quarter of this year has continued to see inflows of capital from sophisticated investors such as corporate and public pension plans, endowments, foundations, allocating to hedge funds because it is additive to the portfolio mix and the diversification that they're trying to achieve as they look at their asset, as they look at their asset liability mix. Jack, continuing along the line of education, AIMA also recently released a report by German academics, a study that showed a, sh a strong correlation between uh, capital market size and GDP growth. Now, what was the thinking behind this initiative? I, I think it was a very timely report, Greg, in that so much of the focus from policymakers and regulators since the crisis was been, was, has been on the banks and the banking system and how do we make sure that doesn't happen again and we reduce some of the risk to financial stability that were caused within the banking system. Now that has largely been done, or maybe it hasn't, there's a lot of focus now turning towards asset managers and what risk there might be within the asset management system, either at the fund level or at the aggregate level at the asset managers themselves. And this is not just solely at, at, at hedge funds, but it's the whole of the asset management industry, of which the hedge fund industry is just one part. What I think is very, very important, as governments all around the world now turn their attention towards growth and economic prosperity and to jobs, is that they have as best understanding as they possibly can of the importance of capital markets in driving economic growth and prosperity in each region. And that's particularly true in bank-centric economies such as we have in Europe, but it's not uniquely applied just to economies like that. What is very clear from an academic standpoint, and this is we commissioned this academic study, is that there is a very clear linkage between activity in capital markets, and by that I mean activity in equity financing and debt financing markets. There's a very clear linkage between levels of activity in that and levels of activity uh, in, in, econo in the economy and in GDP growth. I think it's very helpful having an academic study do that, um, so that when we go to, to policymakers and go to regulators, there's some very true and real empirical evidence that this is the case. So that when regulators think about additional measures they can bring to what they think is to reduce risk within the financial system by now focusing on asset managers, they do that in the context of, uh, of understanding the importance of the capital markets, which is really where asset managers play, including hedge funds. So it was very much a macro study. It was intended to educate. We've taken it to to regulators in Brussels and in Germany so far, and we've published it, and it's been picked up to pretty universal positive response of what we're trying to achieve, which is better understanding and better education of the capital markets, because that is really at the heart of the matter here. AIMA is widely considered a go-to organization on the AIFMD, and you released a set of guidelines for managers to comply. You were also successful in modifying some specifics on the directive. Now, are you still focusing on AIFMD, or has your focus shifted to a degree to the U.S., to the SEC and the CFTC? Yes, AIFMD was a, was a huge body of work. 
for us, and, and it um, took up a lot of our time. It's probably the biggest file that we ever worked on. But it's really only one piece of, of new regulation that has been put in place since the crisis that impact our, our members. All along, there were issues which were being governed by the SEC or the CFTC, or for that matter, regulators anywhere else around the world, uh, which were going to have an impact and do have an impact on our members. Now, specifically to, uh, to the CFTC, for example, which has been charged with implementing Dodd-Frank around the new rules for OTC derivatives reform, for central clearing in particular. And that continues to be a very important area of work for us because as, as it stands currently at the moment, we see significant regulatory overlaps between the G20 effort as being handled by EMEA in Europe and the Dodd-Frank efforts as being handled by the CFTC in the United States. We see significant overlap there, which is going to impact our members. And therefore, it's very important that we engage with the CFTC in a very constructive way, and also with the SEC, in trying to achieve outcomes um, to remove some of this confusion that is caused by the regulatory overlap. And let me be clear about that. As it currently stands at the moment, when central clearing goes mandatory in Europe, which is likely to do either at the end of this year or in the early part of 2015, if no change happens, there are many hedge fund managers, many of our members, and indeed many other market participants, who are going to be faced, facing two sets of rules where they will have to make a decision. And the decision will be which of those rules are they going to have to break to comply with the other. Because at the moment it is impossible to comply with both sets of, both sets of rules in the two regimes. So that overlap needs to be addressed. We're having very constructive conversations with the CFTC about this at the moment, and we hope to get some sort of resolution in the months ahead. But that's just one example of why it is important for us in the global context to engage with regulators, and in this instance, with US regulators in Washington. We have to engage in the US because these issues don't just impact US managers, they impact hedge fund managers all around the world who are conflicted or potentially conflicted by the overlap in rules here. But let's look at the U.S. managers, for example. U.S. managers now invest in every single part of the world, but well, the largest ones certainly invest in every single part of the world. Local regulations for those in those markets are very important for U.S. managers. And I think where we've seen some very strong growth in AMA's membership has been from U.S. managers but particularly those ones who are looking outside of their own country borders and looking for AIMA's assistance to help them navigate within the rules in markets all around the world, whether they be in the UK, whether they be in the rest of Europe, or whether they be all around the Asia-Pacific region, where we have a very strong and historic presence as well. From a global perspective, which you alluded to, Talk about some of your efforts to help managers in the Asia-Pacific region, such as, uh, I know you have offices in Hong Kong, Tokyo, Japan, Australia. How are you helping those managers? So we've had a, a presence in a number of those areas and those locations for, for many, many years now. And in many ways, they grew up as, as somewhat autonomous units of AMA, as local members, local hedge fund managers, got together and said, we want to, to, to be under the umbrella of AMA, but have our own local national group. As a result, we've got um, national groups and, and, and presences in Hong Kong and in Singapore and Australia and Japan. But I think it's now really important to try and bring these together in, in, a, in a more combined regional effort to be a significant part of our global effort. So that's one of my, my real ambitions at the moment is to coordinate our activities in the individual countries out there in a more cohesive way. What I'm also looking at is China at the moment, which is a fascinating country for many different reasons, but specifically within the hedge fund industry. Liberalization is clearly paving the way for substantial growth in hedge fund-like products. And by that I mean domestic managers operating in a hedge fund type fund structure. There are already some very large managers out there, some very large managers who are attracting foreign capital. And I think the work that AIMA can take into China is one of education at the starting point so that local managers in the PRC can actually learn from some of the 
the, the lessons that large and successful managers elsewhere around the world have, have benefited from. And we can take some of those lessons and sound practices and guide the, the industry there, then I think they will be very successful there as well. So we've just held a conference in, in Shanghai. We're going to hold another one in Beijing in, in June. And the turnout and the reception there has been very positive. And what is clear is that there's going to be some significant growth in a hedge fund-like industry in that country.